Yeah. So just before the break, we started John chapter 21, and we looked at uh, these disciples who have decided to go out to fish. And we see in verse 3, John 21, verse 3, that they were unable to catch any fish. Um, this is almost um, uh, you know, a repetition of what had occurred long ago, about three years back, when they first were called into ministry. Uh, um, so um, if we were to turn to Luke chapter 5, um, we see over there in Luke chapter 5 that uh, Jesus sees these first disciples fishing. And then, uh, uh, you know, they have not caught anything. And then um, Jesus says to them, throw the nets on the other side. And they have a huge catch, which they are able to get. That would be in Luke 5. And at the end of that um, passage, Luke chapter 5, if we were to look at uh, verses 10 and 11, this is what it says over there. So if we could have someone please read out for us Luke chapter 5, uh, verses 10 and 11, please. Luke 5, 10 and 11. And so also were James and John, the son of Zebedee, who were, part, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid from now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they shook, they forsook all and followed him. It says yeah. that they forsook all and followed him. That is, they gave up everything. Um, here in this, I think this is, uh, I'm not sure which version I have with me right now. Um, it says over here, when they had brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. So which means, you know, now onwards, their main uh, full-time task would be to be with Jesus, learn from him, uh, help him in the ministry that he is doing and all of that. So whenever they would get an opportunity, yes, they would, uh, you know, uh, support themselves. But what would be their main focus, their topmost priority from now on? It would be the calling which Jesus has given to them. He said, from now on, you are going to be catching people, not fish. Okay, so um, this does not mean that they uh, were always depending on upon, upon other people to support them and their families. It just means that from now on, their first topmost priority would be to do whatever Jesus commands them to do. So uh, in that sense, you know, they became uh, full-time ministers. So uh, later on, we see Paul and his team also doing full-time ministry. But even as they did their full-time ministry, to the extent possible, they um, supported themselves uh, by making tents and, you know, um, uh, taking part in other forms of trade. So here, um, on this occasion, again, they're unable to catch uh, a fish in John chapter 21. And Jesus says, cast your nets on the right side. Um, um, and it, it seems in those days, it, uh, the fishing uh, people generally would cast the net on the left side, it seems. So, um, uh, but now Jesus says, you know, cast it on the right side. And they're actually able to catch many fish. Um, so uh, that causes John to realize that this must be Jesus. Uh, and uh, so he quickly comes, you know, you know Peter uh, gets down to the water and comes running to the shore and then all the other disciples catch up and they all eat together. Um, and then this conversation begins in verse 15, John chapter 21, Jesus' conversation with Peter. So this is basically what G Jesus says to Peter. Uh, so maybe if we could have someone read out for us, John chapter 21, uh, from verse 15 all the way up to verse 17. John 21, 15 to 17. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, 
you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lads. He said to him again the second time, a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Amen. Yes, thank you. Uh, so here, this is the question which Jesus places before Peter. He says, do you love me more than these? So maybe Jesus is referring back to the first time when Peter and the other disciples were called into ministry. And he's saying, yes, you will always have human responsibilities. Yes, you will have need to go and do fishing. But do you love me more than these, all these earthly responsibilities that you have, more than this, uh, you know, the, this need to be able to make money, to be able to earn a livelihood? Do you love me more than these things? Peter's immediate response is, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, you know, is what uh, Peter says. Now, there are so many things which are said regarding this passage. We will look at it in stages. Um, uh, so first, let's, uh, let's just, uh, you know, look at this commission, the recommissioning that Jesus is doing over here. Okay, so we'll just dwell on that first. Uh, so um, Peter and the disciples have been fishing. And now the question that Jesus is asking is, do you love me more than these things? You, you will have earthly responsibilities. You will need to earn a livelihood. But just like on that day, you know, in Luke chapter 5, where you people gave up everything uh, to become fishers of men, are you willing to now, you know, uh, do that again? Are you willing to resume that? And uh, Peter's immediate response is, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. You know, and so Jesus believes him and Jesus says, feed my lambs. All right. So um, there are, we, we see this being repeated thrice. The first time he says, feed my lambs. Um, the second time he says, tend my sheep. And the third time he says, feed my sheep. So you have lambs being mentioned and you have sheep being mentioned. Lambs, of course, would be the younger um the younger offspring of the of the grown up sheep sheep of course are the you know the the grown up uh, animals um so there would be youngsters to be taken care of maybe those who are spiritually young and there would be uh, older um, uh, sheep also who would need to be taken care of uh, so that word that is used over there feed is used twice it just basically talks about uh, grazing you know you graze the sheep so in the same way, when it comes to the human flock, the few human flock would have to be fed, um, uh, taken care of in, in different ways. And then uh, in the second occasion, he says, tend my sheep. The word that is used over there, it's not referring so much to grazing. Uh, that word that is used over there is talking more about um, leading, um, guiding. So in that sense, it's it has more to do with governance it has more to do with uh, you know uh, matters of leadership um, uh, matters of um, uh, decision making you know how you're going to look after them uh, what are the things that you're going to be doing for them so that they will grow in the lord uh, all of those um, things are referred to so you have the so when it comes to this whole matter of doing ministry of being fishers of men this is what it would involve. It would involve feeding them spiritual food. It would also involve leading them and guiding them and uh, taking care of decision taking, uh, you know, decision um, matters and things like that. Uh, so they, it's talking about leadership. It's talking about service. It's talking about taking care uh, and you no know, tending in that sense as well. Um, so. Uh, if you were to, you know, um, reflect upon Ezekiel 34, where God, Yahweh, uh, talks about these false shepherds who were not good, uh, you know, uh, shepherds to the people. 
and uh, you know, if we were to go back to Ezekiel th chapter 34, this is the accusation which Yahweh makes about these people. Uh, he, he says in uh, Ezekiel 34 verse 2, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. You know, should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You know, is what it says over there in Ezekiel 34 verse 2. And then God says, you eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. You know, rather than looking after them, you kill them and you clothe yourself with that wool. Those are the kind of shepherds that you, you know, you are. And uh, then he goes on to say, I will raise up a shepherd for myself who will go searching for the flock, the lost ones. He'll bring them back. And that was Jesus, the true shepherd, you know, who came and did that for us. So now these people are being called to take on that same responsibility, Peter and all of the others. They are going to become shepherds. And this is what would be expected of them. Because in Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 4, you kind of have a small uh, uh, role description of what a shepherd should be doing. What exactly, uh, of course, these false shepherds were not doing those things, but this is what a true shepherd should be doing. Ezekiel 34, verse 4. It talks about how the weak will have to be strengthened. Not everyone is going to be spiritually mature and strong. Uh, the shepherd would have to go after the weak, sit with them, you know, encourage them, help them to take a more active role in, the, in developing their relationship with the Lord. So someone would have to sit with them and strengthen them. It also talks about how the sick would need to be healed. So there would be those who would require physical healing. There would also be those who um, are maybe spiritually sick and uh, need to be restored. So that also would be involved. Verse uh, Ezekiel 34, 4 also talks about how the broken need to be bound up. There are those who have been injured, uh, maybe both emotionally as well as um, in a spiritual sense. So someone needs to uh, bind up their wounds and you know help them to recover. It even talks over there in Ezekiel 34, 4 about people who have been driven away and so someone needs to go after them and bring them back. You know, those who have been hurt in the church uh, by other believers. Uh, so someone has to go after them and bring them back to the flock so that Satan will not take advantage of the situation and harm them. Um, so and then, they, they, of course, um, you know, the leaders also have to be people who will seek those who are lost, those who have never come to the fold. So you go after all the lost sheep out in the world and you bring them to the fold of the Lord. Uh, so these are all the different things that a shepherd actually does. Uh, so here when Jesus is saying to Peter, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, tend my sheep. These are all the things which Peter is being asked to do. So if he is going to be only interested in you know, fishing, then these tasks will get neglected. So it is important that Simon, son of Jonah, should love the Lord more than these earthly things, because only then, you know, uh, if, if his priorities are right, only then will he prove to be a, a good servant of his master. Right. So that's regarding the feeding of the lambs and the tending of the sheep and all of that. Uh, coming to the other aspect where there's a lot said about the words which are used in the original Greek for uh, love. All right. Uh, um, a lot of uh, wrong interpretations are given. And it all this only started 1960 onwards. Before that, people did not really think about this passage in, uh, you know, in such a negative sense. Um, what happened was that in 1960, C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Four Loves, where he kind of, you know, took four Greek words and he gave them very, very specific definitions and said, you know what, this word means this and this word, this Greek word means this. And so this is this kind of love. And this love is inferior to that love. And this love is better than the other type of love and all of that. But actually, if you look at if you look into your Greek Bible and you look at uh, those four words being used in different places, that kind of strict demarcation is not there between these words. These words were used more as synonyms. You know, um, uh, I may say that I, uh, you know, 
adore my dog or i may say that i love my dog they just two ways of saying that i have affection for my dog uh, so i have used in fact three words now you know a love adore and affection uh, they're all kind of synonyms um so which was what the case was with agape and phileo it's not like as if agape is in some way some kind of superior kind of a love nor is it a kind of divine love it's just a word for love phileo is in in, in the same way not an inferior word for love it's just another word uh, for love and we will actually look at passages which you know uh, which would prove this uh, case so uh, what we actually learn from commentaries um, is that um, uh, these words were phileo and uh, agape were kind of used as synonyms and inter used interchangeably okay so uh, they were not you know, meant to be um, uh, used very distinctively but new testament writers began to choose this word agape more and more whenever they would talk about the love of god simply because this word agape the emphasis of that word is more on the object that is being loved okay so um the object that is loved is cherished it is treasured uh, the object of that that is being loved is considered as precious it's considered as valuable and important so there was this slight nuance to this particular word agape uh, which was not there in the other word um, phileo so people, the new testament writers started using this word agape more for god's love and that is basically how a demarcation came about okay so originally in the greek language when people used to speak these two words were just very um commonly used as synonyms and we see that happening in many places in the new testament but um um new testament writers began to choose this word agape for two reasons one of course is that the, is the heavy emphasis which is there on the object where the person who is doing the loving considers this object so precious so valuable even though it may be something ordinary the person who is loving it consider, considers it very very valuable the other thing is that it's not really an emotional kind of a love phileo is a very very emotional word it's the kind of love that you know exists between family members uh, with friends it's 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 very heavily emotional phileo is very very emotional agape on the other hand is something that you choose to do and whether you feel like it or not you do it because that object that you love is that special and that dear so whether you feel like it or not you do it which is why you see um you know, when uh, um, you know the commandment is given to husbands and wives in Ephesians chapter 5 uh, that word agape is used and in Ephesians 5:25 this is what it says over there husbands love your wife agape your wives just as Christ agape the church so you know in this modern era you have people uh, in broken homes they say oh i don't feel love for my spouse anymore so i think i should just leave the person it's not about emotion it's not phileo okay phileo will be there on some days phileo will not be there on some days but you don't go by emotions you you make a choice it's a will and you declare and say yes i shall be faithful to this person so agape does not depend on emotions it considers the object valuable enough whether you're feeling like it or not whether you're feeling phileo or not you will choose to express love okay so it's in in that sense it's unconditional all right so um, agape and phileo are both good words phileo is in no way an inferior word um, and we see this in um especially in John chapter 5 verse 20 where it very clearly says the father phileo the son okay so this is a the word phileo is used for the father's love for Jesus Christ so it's in no way inferior to agape all right so agape is beautiful phileo is also beautiful it's just that uh, phileo is a very emotional a uh, word where you feel a lot of emotion towards your loved ones towards your friends towards your the people who are close to you agape on the other hand is more um uh, stable 
doesn't go by emotions it just decides in its heart you know this person is valuable deserves to be loved irrespective of whether i'm feeling like it or not i am going to love this person so it's it's, some, it's more stable kind of a word um, okay so that's just the difference so now having understood the background if we were to look at what is happening over here in the conversation between jesus and um, uh, peter um, jesus says to him in verse 15 uh simon do you agape me more than all these things of the world you know and uh, immediately peter replies and says yes lord you know that i fillet you you know from the bottom of his heart with all his emotion he's saying lord i fillet you so yes lord you know you're going to be my first priority but then jesus says to him a second time do you agape me and he's probably puzzled that jesus is asking this a second time and he says Yes lord you know that i feel you you and he's still using the deep emotional you know that 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 word which is packed with a lot of emotion and uh, so then uh, the third time uh, jesus uses the emotional word and he he says to him um, uh, simon son of jonah uh, do you feel you me and over here he's also using that emotion emotional word that feel you word and and he says that the third time we are told in verse 17 peter was grieved because uh, he said to him the third time do you fileo me um, and he just replies and says lord you know all things you know that i fileo you uh, so because now peter kind of catches what is happening here jesus is asking him three times and so he would have been reminded about how when they were in front of another fire he denied him three times and said no i do not even know this person and uh, so it probably reminded him of that occasion and peter is grieved that jesus is saying this to the to him for the third time and he says lord you know you know all things so you know whether i really you know fillet you or you or not um and uh, so this uh, passage troubled me for a long time because we are told in scripture that once god forgives he does not remind you of your sin he does not rub it in again and again what is forgiven is forgiven uh, so um, i always wondered why did jesus you know rub it in poor peter i'm sure you know he 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 weeps bitterly after the third betrayal you know after he betray, betrays jesus for the third time so he has repented he is no longer uh, you know uh, against jesus why does jesus bring this up for the third time to hurt his feelings you know it's a question which is always there in my heart um but then i uh, uh, you know um, read somewhere about this and i kind began to understand uh jesus says this to him to help him bring a to to put a closure to what happened you know so because maybe peter was always reminded of what he had done maybe that guilt of that always rested upon him and now jesus wants to completely remove him from that feeling of guilt and show him that he's going to go on to much greater things and he need, he needs to leave this behind he doesn't have to go on holding on to this so because you see peter says lord you know all things and jesus confirms to him that he indeed knows all things in fact he knows to what extent peter is going to fileo him and so he goes on to say yeah i know this is what is going to happen in the future so jesus says to him very truly i tell you when you were younger you dressed yourself and went where you wanted but when you are old you will stretch out your hands and over there the wording that is used over there is the kind of wording that is used about you know hands being stretched out on a cross you know so um, and he, he, jesus says to him someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go and in, in fact in verse 19 it confirms and we are told jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which peter would glorify god so Jesus is telling him you can put behind you know whatever happened uh, you know you have repented put it behind you do not continue to live in guilt move on from there because indeed i do know all things you know jesus is confirming to him and saying yes you do fileo me 
In fact, you phileo me to an extent where you're going to be doing this. You'll be glorifying God one day in that manner. And then you have a very interesting statement. Um, you know, um, uh, yeah, he's, then he said to him, uh, follow me. And of course, you know, Peter is more than willing to follow Jesus in spite of knowing this is the way he's going to be, uh, you know, die if he follows Jesus. He doesn't care about that. He's more than willing to follow Jesus. So, he you know, he... And then in verse 20, it says, Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. Now, this is something so wonderful. You know, this conversation which happens between Peter and Jesus is a private conversation. It's not happening with all the other disciples sitting over there as an audience. It looks like the meal has finished. They have got up. They have, you know, they have, they have both of them together are walking down the beach. The others are not listening into what's going on. So in private, Jesus brings up this topic of what he had done in the past, you know, the betrayal that has taken place in the past. And uh, three times Jesus asks the question. Three times Peter replies, yes, I fillet you. And he says, Lord, you know all things. And Jesus says, very truly, this is how you're going to glorify me one day. So, you know, uh, what has happened is now put to rest. Jesus helps him to Bring you know, Jesus brings closure to whatever has taken place, and now Peter can move on confidently, knowing that you know uh, God is going to strengthen him because that is what Jesus uh, says to him earlier. He says, "You will be sifted like wheat, but don't worry, you know, I, because I have prayed for you." And he says, "You will return, and when you return, you will strengthen your brethren." You know, so now he is going to be feeding the sheep. He is going to be tending the flock. He is going to be a, a leader. So Jesus brings closure to that issue. So if you and I are still living under the dark cloud of something that we have done in the past, and it keeps coming back to you again and again, no matter what you do uh, for the Lord, that comes back to you. And you think, oh, this is who I am. This is what I did. This was the kind of person I was. And if you're still being haunted by that again and again, Maybe you should sit down with this passage and you know uh, reflect upon it as though Jesus is speaking these words to you and he's asking you now in the present, do you agape me? And like Peter, are you able to respond with all of your heart and say, yes, Lord, I phileo you? If that is the case, then know that in the same way that you know Jesus wanted Peter to move on, and become a person who will strengthen his brethren, who will tend to the flock. That is the same role that Jesus wants for you as well. So do not live in the past. What happened, happened. Yes, three times maybe you denied Jesus. But now three times, you know, you're honestly declaring and saying, yes, I feel you with the Lord. And the Lord has accepted that. Because the Lord has accepted that, he is saying, yes, now fulfill the role which I'm giving you. And he's saying, follow me. Are you willing to follow him? Or are you going to be haunted by that thing in the past which the Lord himself has forgiven? If the Lord has forgiven it, who are you to hold on to it? You know, so um, are you greater than the Lord to refuse to forgive yourself? Who on earth made you God? Let the Lord decide what needs to be forgiven and what should not be forgiven. Because he's the one who paid the price for it. I mean, he paid the price in full. That is a forgiven sin. Are you saying that the blood of Christ was not enough to, to forgive you of that sin? I mean, how, how can you say that that's the, that's the blood of Christ that has completely cleansed you of that sin? You know, 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just because he's acting upon what was done on the cross and therefore he chooses to forgive you. And you are forgiven. And he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness, is what, is what it says over there in verse John 1 9. So, therefore, like Peter, we can move on with our lives and glorify God in the way Peter glorified. And so, in fact, you know, uh, what we are told in the commentaries is that um, by the time John writes this gospel, uh, what Jesus had prophesied had probably already taken place. Peter probably was crucified during the time of uh, Nero, you know, so uh, he would probably be dead by now. 
by the time this particular gospel was written because you know if you were if you have done all the gospels you would know um, um, the first three were written earlier on and the gospel of john was the last one to be written a little later uh, so by this time um, peter's uh, crucifixion probably would have happened already uh, you know just to address the question which uh, rosalind has posted over here uh, so is uh, the agape love an unconditional love uh, like we like we talked about agape is this very stable love its emphasis is, is on the object that is being loved so whether you're feeling phileo whether you're emotionally moved from the depths of your being to express love or not you just choose to love it's a very stable love and therefore when we are commanded by uh, god you know to love um, uh, the lord we are told to uh, we, we are this this word this is the word which is used um okay um maybe john um 1423 in john 1423 jesus an answered and said to him if anyone agape me he will keep my word and my father will agape him and we will come to him and make our home with him so here jesus is saying it, it's not a divine love which only god can feel no that's a very wrong definition humans are quite capable of expressing agape love the in fact we are being commanded to express agape love jesus commands us in john 14:23 and says to us if anyone agape me let him show that in action you know by keeping my word those who obey me and keep my word and submit to it they are the people who agape me you don't depend on phileo only when you're feeling phileo you don't just obey the lord whether you're feeling emotions or not you choose to obey him and when you do that the father in that same steady manner he will agape you and in fact it says we will come the you know the father and jesus you know along with the holy spirit he will come to you and make our home with you so we literally have the triune godhead living in us making his home in us willing to consider ordinary human beings as his temple I mean you know in the old testament times the temple was revered it was something respected because that is where the presence of god dwelt and today you and i are that temple this almighty god is choosing to you know that in that day he chose to stay in a temple that was plated with gold and which had golden vessels which were used for the service and today he's staying inside humans just made of flesh we sweat i mean at times our health is you know may maybe not good sometimes we are strong sometimes we are weak he has chosen to dwell in a in a in a perishable clay jar like this the almighty one he has chosen to make his home with us you know it's not just you know like he's just coming over there as a kind of duty he wants to be with us he considers us family so how careful we should be in the thoughts which run through our minds you know do we have all kinds of hatreds and jealousies and greed and pride in our mind that is no way to honor this amazing god so agape love is a good love sometimes you know uh, we don't go with our emotions we choose to be steady in the way we choose to love him so yes in that sense it's a steady love not based on emotions in that sense it is an unconditional love okay so whether we are whether i'm feeling the condition of love or not i will still love so in that sense it is unconditional of course all right so um yes um if we can have someone read out verses 20 and 21 So here, here we are in chapter twenty-one. If someone could read out verses twenty and twenty-one. Ah, in fact, maybe up to twenty-five. Yeah. Ah, uh, John chapter twenty-one. If someone could read from twenty all the way up to twenty-five. Yeah. 
Then Peter turning around saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter seeing him said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. But if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Amen. So uh, we had seen in our introduction that um, some copies, original copies that have you know survived and come to us, um, they contain only 20 chapters. Whereas we have some other manuscripts which contain 21 chapters. So which is why it, uh, people said that maybe John actually, when he first wrote, uh, he just finished off with chapter 20. And then later, he wanted to clarify and clear up certain additional things, which is why maybe uh, you know he, he again under the he was inspired by God to add one more chapter, which is why in some manuscripts you have 21 chapters being mentioned. Uh, so they say that maybe this was one thing which he wanted to very clearly clarify. There was this false rumor going around uh, saying that oh John is never going to die; he's going to stay alive till the you know second coming of the Lord. Uh, so. Uh, if people hold on to that kind of a belief and then you know one day john dies then it would affect the faith of people so he wanted to make that very very clear that this is not at all what was meant when peter asks jesus what about him jesus says you know you mind your own business i mean you take care of your life uh, what i will do with other people that's between me and them you know so uh, so he jesus only meant it in that sense um, so John wants to clarify and make it very clear to the readers that in no way is he going to be immortal. He's going to die the same way everyone else has you know, died. Uh, so in fact, we learn from uh, Jewish tradition that he most probably was you know, uh, burnt to death, uh, is what they say. Uh, I mean, um, there's no clear historical record regarding that. But yeah, so even uh, you know John dies just like all the other people, and uh, so now we have a second conclusion over here in, at the end of uh, chapter uh, twenty-one, where it uh, where the where this John is saying we know that his testimony is true. He's talking about himself. You know, he says, "I am that disciple, uh, you know, who leaned on Jesus' breast, uh, and about whom Peter asked this question." And so he says, uh, "We know that his testimony is true." Um, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. So you again have a repetition of what was mentioned in the earlier chapter. So in this way, uh, you know, uh, the Gospel of John uh, comes to a conclusion. Um, so uh, after we have covered all of these things, uh, Anything that anyone wants to say regarding the entire Gospel of John, I mean, I don't mean just today's class, any comments that you would like to make or any question that you would like to raise. Um, um, yeah. Otherwise, you know, we can actually close early <laughs> with a word of prayer. But if anyone wants to ask anything at all from the Gospel of John, which has been covered so far, um, yeah, you can go ahead. No? All right. Okay. Then in that case, um, let's close. So, of course, you know, next week um, we will get into the epistles. Um, yeah. Lord, we just thank you so much for all the lessons that we could have, uh, that we, we were able to learn up to now from the Gospel of John. Thank you, O Lord. Um, uh, Lord, uh, it, it has been very clearly established that you are the Son of God, that you are the Messiah who has come. 
and it is through you alone that we can have eternal life. Lord, we pray that even as we have um, learned these truths, even as we have spent time reflecting upon them, now, O oh Lord, we will fulfill the commission that you have given us and go out and share these things with other people. Lord, even as we carry the Holy Spirit now within us, we know, O oh Lord, that he will convict uh, the people whom we speak to. So we pray, O oh Lord, that we will do our part so that the Holy Spirit can work through us and bring about a work of conviction and repentance. We pray, O oh Lord, that um, in uh, whenever we have the time, we will go through this book once again. Uh, we will reflect on the important truths that are contained in it, uh, that, Lord, we would absorb them into our hearts and minds and then go out and share these things with other people so that they may be benefited, so that they may know you in a personal way, um, that, in, uh, that we know you, O oh Lord. We pray that you would uh, anoint all of us for this task, O oh Lord. Um, every single student who has attended so far, uh, me, O oh Lord, who has tried to teach some of these truths and concepts, please, Lord, we pray that you would anoint us afresh, equip us, O oh Lord, so that what we have learned through this um, Gospel of John, we will not just keep it to ourselves, but we will go and share it with others so that, Lord, uh, they too can be part of your flock. They too can enjoy the eternal life which we enjoy. Thank you, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for staying with me throughout the Gospel of John. And uh, yeah, next week, we will begin with the uh, epistles. Thank you.